Today I'm going to go through one of the oldest and most principled openings, the Italian. So the Italian starts with the move e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4. And this is the move that signifies that this is going to be an Italian. As we put a bishop on c4, it's a very principled, very active square where it's controlling the center and aiming at pawn f7. Now, as we can see, this bishop on c4 is extremely strong. And as we'll see, this is actually one of our best minor pieces. So we want to keep that in mind. We don't want to make it easy for black to trade it off, especially not with this knight on c6, which is an idea we're going to see very soon. Bishop c5 is the main move, and it's the move that we're going to cover today. Now, there is also an alternative with the move knight f6, but I think that deserves its own video. So perhaps next time. So after bishop c5, there are a few ways white can play. Now the most enterprising move is of course b4. Now this is known as the Evans Gambit and it's without question the sharpest way to continue in this position. If anyone here is looking for a Gambit line against e4, e5, then this is probably your best bet because the Evans is considered to be you know, one of the few fully correct Gambits that are still sort of playable nowadays in the computer era. So after bishop takes b4, we continue with c3, hitting the bishop, the idea behind this sacrifice is of course to force the bishop to go to the b4 square so we can gain a tempo playing c3 and follow up with d4 with expansion in the center. We also have very typical ideas like queen b3 targeting this pawn on f7. So the old main line is the move bishop a5 and this actually was considered very risky for a long time but computers have sort of revived this line. Although credit where credit is due, the main resource for black was found back in 1984, before computers really were a thing. So after d4, d6, white now continues with queen b3, hitting the pawn on f7. So black needs to play the move queen d7, because if he plays queen e7, then d5 is suddenly a problem. And if knight moves, then actually queen b5 check is winning this bishop on a5. So not advisable. So instead black needs to play the move queen d7. And after d takes e5, well, d takes e5 is natural, but it will actually be wrong because after bishop a3, it turns out that it's really hard for black to complete his development because he can never really castle as we're controlling the f8 square. And he can't play a move like knight e7 because the f7 pawn would hang. But instead, after d takes e5, black has a very nice idea which was found by the super grandmaster Jan Timmen back in 1984. That's the move bishop b6, and this is a very nice idea which the computers fully approve of. So black is not trying to keep his gambit pawn because that would be very dangerous. Instead, he's happily allowing white to trade it back off, but he wants to get white's best piece, that's the bishop on c4, in return. For instance, if we were to take on d6, then now black could play the move knight a5, and after a queen move, we could take on c4, Queen takes c4, and after queen takes d6, this was actually how that game went, and black went on to convert a very nice endgame with the two bishops. Now after bishop b6, things are by no means conclusive. White still has many ideas, like even for instance bishop b5, pinning the knight and stopping knight a5, and if a6, he can now drop back to a4, and again d takes e5 is not possible because we can take back with the knight. Yeah, so certainly many ways for white to play here. And I would say the Evans Gambit is still a fully playable line, although it is somewhat less dangerous than it was when it first came out. So going back to this position, another very exciting move is the move C3. And this is actually a very enticing move at the scholastic level, because if black doesn't know what he's doing, he can lose the game in just two moves. In fact, I've seen many games go like this. Black plays D6, which is already a big mistake. Now white plays d4, ed4, cd4, bishop b6, and now it continues with h3, stopping bishop g4. Now he's going to castle and play knight c3, and with this really nice center, it's clear which side has the advantage. Now instead, after c3, black needs to be very accurate, and he needs to know a series of good moves. Although once you know it, it's not too hard to find. Black plays move knight f6, obviously hitting the pawn on e4. And now white continues with d4, e takes d4, and the idea is of course if we take c takes d4, black is going to play bishop b4 check, and if knight c3, this is the old gambit line if knight takes e4. 
But after castles, bishop takes c3, a very important move. b takes c3, and now d5. I'm not exactly sure what kind of compensation we have. So firstly, this bishop on c4 is attacked, so we have to move it. And now we are just one move short, because if we had one more move to play bishop a3, then it could actually be quite dangerous. But here black is just in time to castle. And yes, we have some compensation for this pawn, but I'm not quite sure that it's enough for more than equality at the very best. So after c takes d4, bishop b4 check, the main line is actually to play the move bishop d2. And the idea is that after bishop takes d2, knight b takes d2, d5 takes knight takes d5, I think that black is doing sort of okay here. After all, white has this isolated pawn on d4, black's going to castle followed by move flat bishop e6, and I don't think black should have any problems here. In fact, his results have been very good. So going back to the position after e takes d4, the main move is to play e5. And a very common trap is that the move knight e4 would actually lose a piece after bishop d5. Now black can still take on f2, king takes f2, d takes c3, but just simply king f1, and the compensation is a bit dubious to say the least. So going back to this position, black needs to find an only move. That's the move d5, hitting the bishop on c4. Now white continues with bishop b5, and now knight e4. c takes d4, and bishop b4 check. Now here the main move is to play bishop d2, and here black has a lot of options. So knight takes d2 is the main line. Knight b takes d2, castles, castles, knight e7, bishop a5, and get black has very much a playable position. You can continue with c6 when it's very nice structure, as well as the two bishops. And on a good day, he could play a move like f6, undermining the white center. So I think black is actually doing very well here. Now the main line is of course to play the move castles. And this is the quietest of all moves. So white is going for a slow positional game. It's not without venom, as in most positional lines. So black plays knight f6. Now simply d3, protecting the pawn on e4, d6, now c3. Our long-term idea will be to try to play the move d3 to d4, which would gain us a lot of space in the center. Here black plays the move castles. Now, in passing, I think it's worth mentioning that the move h3 would be inaccurate. Now in general, we want to be very careful about playing moves like h3 too early, because obviously the move h3 is quite useful, in connection with the plan of c3, d4, because we are stopping a move like bishop g4, which would make it quite difficult for us to keep our pawn on d4, because black is threatening to remove the defender of that pawn. So h3 is a very typical move that should be played in many positions, but not here, because here black hasn't castled yet, and this allows him to get his ideas in after the move h6, c3, so d4 is a threat now, and black anticipates this playing the move bishop b6. Now rook e1, because d4 can now be met by taking this pawn on e4, so it seems like white is going ahead with his plan, and black's gonna castle, we're gonna reach a normal position, right? Well not quite, because here black can play the move g5, and he's scored very well in this position. The idea is of course to play the move g4, and to use this hook with this pawn on h3 to create immediate attack on the king side. For instance, after the move d4, black can continue with the move g4, h takes g4, and now knight takes g4, and is ready with the move queen f6 to exert even more pressure on the pawn on d4. And we can see the knight on g4 is actually quite useful, because not only is it putting lots of pressure on the pawn on f2, but it's also stopping moves like bishop e3, which would defend the pawn on d4. So back to the game, the move c3 is correct. Now black castles. Now we play the move rook e1, and this is a very useful move for a couple of reasons. Mainly it has to do with this knight on b1. So you might ask, what's so special about this rook and this knight, really? Well, it turns out that this knight on b1 doesn't really have a very good square at first glance. Because obviously the knight would have loved to go to the c3 square, but we actually needed that square for the pawn so that we can support the move d3 to d4 in the future. Now that c3 square is no longer available for this knight, where should we put it? Well, the old masters devised a very nice regrouping. 
It starts with the move knight d2, and the knight heads to the f1 square. And on the f1 square, the knight can either go to g3, where it supports the pawn on e4, preparing the move d3 to d4, or alternatively, it can go to the e3 square, where it takes full control over the d5 square, making it very hard for black to move d6 to d5. So certainly a very natural way to develop this knight. And we can see it's very effective. So here black's main move is a6, and actually this is a very important moment, because it seems like his move is a waste of time. And haven't we been taught that in the opening, we should develop our pieces without waste of time? Well, not exactly, because this move has a couple of ideas. So firstly, one idea that white could play for is an expansion on the queen side with moves like b4 and a4. And with the move a6, black gets this retreat square on a7 for his bishop. But more importantly, black now has a threat of his own. For instance, if we were to make some move like knight bd2, now black could play the move knight a5, and now he's going to get our best piece, that's the bishop on c4. And once black takes this bishop with his knight, he's going to have a very comfortable position with the two bishops. That's why after a6, we need to do something about this threat of knight a5. And there are two ways to deal with this. So the classical method, the old way, is to play the move bishop b3. And this is very much in the style of the Rai Lopez. The idea is of course that if you play knight a5, then white can just drop back the bishop to c2, and now the knight is looking a bit silly on a5. That being said, after the move bishop a7, this is of course a very typical move that we have seen before, sort of anticipating the move d3 to d4, I think black is doing well. For instance, after h3, h6, knight bd2, rook e8, knight f1, now black can play the move bishop e6, trying to exchange up these light squared bishops. He also has an idea of playing the move d6 to d5. For instance, if we play the move bishop c2, trying to avoid the exchange, now black can play the move d5, e takes, and now bishop takes d5. And after knight g3, queen d7, bishop e3, takes, rook takes e3, we have a very interesting position. Now white's idea will be to try to put pressure on the pawn on e5, playing moves like queen e2, even moves like rook d1, and there's another very typical idea of trying to play for the move d3 to d4. It's also not out of the question to go for some sort of queenside expansion with b4 followed by a4 and b5. So here we have a very complicated position with chances for both sides. So we've established that move bishop b3 is very much a playable option. But nowadays there's a much more trendy idea and it's to play the move a4. And the idea behind this move is of course that if you play knight a5, then the bishop can now drop back to a2. So again, this idea is pointless. And we also have another idea. We want to push the move b4, and at the right moment, push this pawn to b5. And what we want to do is to expand on the queen side, chase this knight of c6 away, and then push the move d3 to d4. In other words, we want our cake and we want to eat it too. Very greedy indeed. So now black plays bishop a7. This is by far the main move. Now we continue with h3. Just to let you know the move h3 is very important here because if we start with the move knight b to d2, that actually allows black an additional very strong option. That is to play knight g4, hitting the pawn on f2. Now you might ask, isn't it really easy to defend this pawn? Say I'll just play rook e2, what's the big deal? Well, black plays king h8. All right, let's kick the knight away. What's the big deal? Well, f5. And that's a bit of an issue, because now if we take the knight on g4, black can take back with the f pawn, and it's ready to jam this pawn all the way to g3. And we can see with this bishop eyeing the king, this is going to be some very strong compensation, or maybe even more. Certainly a very strong initiative for black is incoming. So. We don't want to allow this, and we'd rather just start with the move h3, stopping all of this nonsense. Black starts with h6 as well, knight bd2, rook e8, and now b4. So we see we want to start our plan of expanding on the queen side. Bishop e6 takes, and now rook takes e6. So black has managed to exchange off our best piece, 
That being said, we still have a bit of a pull because we are going for some initiative on the queen side. We have, after all, more space there and the opportunity to play the move b5 at the right moment. So here the main move is queen c2. And if queen d7, now knight to f1. And we don't want to play knight f1 too quickly because if we go knight f1 now, then black plays the move d5. So we'd rather make all the improving moves first before moving this knight. The idea of course is that after queen c2, d5, this would be less advisable because now what gains the extra option of playing knight b3 and he has ideas of going into c5 at the right moment. Not to mention that with the rook protected, there are now ideas like b5. So after queen c2, queen d7 is the main move, preparing to bring the rook into the game, for instance for rook d8 or rook e8. Now knight f1 is the main line. Black plays d5, breaking in the center. Now bishop e3 takes and knight takes e3. So this position looks okay for black. After all, he's exchanged off a lot of pieces and he's certainly got no problems. Or does he? Well, things are not so simple and in the early days of this line, Black was running into lots of problems. For instance, in a top level game between Vichy Anand and Wesley So, Black played the move rook d8. And now, White continued with the move b5, expanding on the queen side. a takes b5, a takes b5, and knight e7. So it seems like Black is still doing very well, except that now Vichy continues with c4, forcing the issue in the center. Black takes the pawn on e4, but after d takes e4, it turns out that the d file isn't quite as important as white control over the a file, because black can't really enter in the position, because then white would come in on the queen side, and some nastiness would ensue. So instead, black decided to play knight g6, but now white came in with rook a7, and after the move c6, simply rook d1, trading off one of a pair of rooks, and now the pawn on b7 hangs. And Vichy went on to convert this quite easily, in fact. So, certainly we can see there are some dangers in Black's position. Now, Black's position is of course not bad. He just has to be a bit careful, as Magnus showed. Now, Magnus played the move knight e7. And the idea is, of course, he's stepping out of the move b5, which is no longer possible. So in his game against Asipenko, he played knight e7, rook b1, rook d8, and after a5, knight g6, c4, simply c6 protecting the center. Now black is a very solid position, and after Asipenko overpressed, Magnus even managed to win this game. So all in all, we can see black has no real problems in any of the lines in the Italian. That being said, he does have to know quite a bit if he is to survive, and that is the key to these e4 lines. So now that you already know the theory of the Italian, next step is to understand how to play these positions, and to do so you want to check out a nice model game, and I've got a great one for you here, so go check it out right now, and I'll see you in the next video.